Well, we are in a message series right now looking at the life of John the Baptizer, noticing different things about him as the forerunner of Jesus. You know, a forerunner is one who goes before someone else, don't they? And uh, that certainly was the role that John played in the life of Christ. And John was called by God to prepare the people for receiving Jesus and his message. And we're also considering how God calls us, each one of us, to be a forerunner of Jesus to the people who are in our circles of influence. You realize you have the circle of influence, right? There are family and friends and co-workers and people that you rub shoulders with as you're out in the community. And God... He is relying on us, each of us, to bring the message of Christ to those that we care about. And the question is, for us this morning anyway, are you doing that? Are you being that forerunner of Christ like John the Baptist was for Jesus? Today we're taking a look at the birth of John the Baptist as brought out in Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 80. So open up your Bibles or open up your smartphone to Luke Chapter 1, verses 57 through 80. And we're going to see this morning how words, your words, have power. And more specifically, we're going to consider some ways by which your words can help people to see Jesus. Maybe you question whether or not your words really matter. If that's the case, I want you to consider for a moment what happened at the wedding of a young couple who were very much in love. They were getting married at their church. And that big day finally arrived. The bride was nervous about the occasion. And so the preacher, he chose a verse of scripture to be read that he felt would be of encouragement to her. And the verse that he had chosen for that day was 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, which says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. And that's a very fitting verse for that kind of an occasion. And the preacher thought that it would be more comforting to the couple and more powerful to the congregation if someone else read that verse. And so he asked the best man if he would read that verse out of 1 John at the appropriate time. And, of course, when the appropriate time in that ceremony came, what the minister didn't realize is that the best man wasn't a believer. And he didn't know that there was a difference between the Gospel of John and the first letter of John. You realize there's like three letters of John that come kind of right before Revelation. And then there's the Gospel of John that, you know, goes along with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at the beginning of the New Testament. And this guy, he didn't realize there was a difference. So during the service, the best man, he introduced the reading by saying, well, the preacher felt this was a good verse for the bride, and he was going to say more about it later on. And then he proceeded to read John 418, the Gospel of John, rather than 1 John. And the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 18 says, this is Jesus speaking, the fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. (laughs) Ugh. You know, sometimes no matter what you say, it just comes out wrong, and all the minister wanted to do was encourage the couple, but things, of course, went very wrong. And so we see words do matter, don't they? Words, they, they make a difference. In Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 66, we see that when the friends and family of Elizabeth asked her what her new baby's name would be, she answered John, and they challenged her on that. They tried to correct her about it, but she corrected them, and she said, no, his name is going to be John. And when that wasn't good enough for those who were challenging her, They looked to the baby's father, Zechariah, and then he confirmed that the baby's name is, in fact, John. Words matter. Words make a difference. And here's what the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 66. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he's going to be called John. And they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. 
And then they made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet. And everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors, they were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. With that bit of communication, Zechariah's tongue was freed. And he could talk again, and he began to sing about God, and he began to sing about his new son, John. And the people, they were in awe, and they began talking about this amazing event, right? And with whoever would listen, they talked about it. And that's what I want us to see in today's message about how we can be a forerunner for Jesus with our family and friends, right? We can be that forerunner. Your words will either help people to see Jesus or your words will hinder them and, and kind of be like a wall keeping them from him. So how can your words help share the message of Jesus? I want to give you seven insights here that come right out of this text. For one thing, you can do this by using your words in a way that praises God. Isn't that what Zechariah did here as we read in verses 64 through 66? God restored his speech after nine months of not being able to talk. And then Zechariah, he begins praising God. Like what we do when we sing here on Sunday mornings as God's people worshiping together. And I always wonder, if, if we're not singing, why are we not singing? Because we are not praising God at that time. Use your words in a way that praises God. Zechariah did that. And as a result, people began to wonder more about God's working, right? They began to wonder more about God's working because of the way that Zechariah was talking. He was praising God. If you praise something, you are expressing admiration. You're expressing strong approval for that. In the case of God, you are worshiping him and you are extolling him above everything and everyone else on this earth. And so when we come together as the body of believers, we come with a desire to respond to God's gracious love and kindness in our life. That's what praise does. And praise helps us to renew our hope within us. It helps to bring inspiration into our life. It helps us as we encounter God with a grateful attitude. Try praising God and not being grateful. If you are feeling unthankful, if you're feeling like there's nothing in this world to be grateful for, start praising God. And all of a sudden, your attitude will change, I guarantee it. Because God is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our worshipful, thankful praise. Now, when God shut Zechariah's mouth and then reopened it during that big public ceremony... To celebrate John's dedication, God created this stir among the people that they remembered 30 years later. John's birth was timed perfectly to coincide six months before Jesus was born. Mary, the mother of Jesus, her pregnancy was perfectly timed as she and Joseph journeyed from Nazareth to Bethlehem. None of this was coincidence. In fact, more than 600 years earlier, through the prophet Micah, we read in Micah 5, 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. That was a prophecy 600 years before Jesus was born, telling where he was going to be born. And he was born exactly there, Bethlehem. So, when Zechariah's speech was finally restored, he realized that God is good and he's good in his own time. And when he used words in praise of God, people wondered about Jesus. They, they started to talk about him. And that's what happens when you and I praise God. Well, another way your words can help spread the message of Jesus serving as a forerunner to prepare people for him is to talk about his story. 
In other words, talk about how God has been faithful throughout the past history, both throughout the centuries as well as throughout your own life. I remember a few years ago, uh, we were in a message and study series called The Story. How many of you remember that? We had these books, right, that we read through, and they, they kind of put the, the events of the Bible in chronological order, and it just kind of showed us how history becomes his story as we recognize that God has worked throughout the years so that everything culminates in knowing and accepting Jesus as the Savior of the world. And guess what? All of history is moving towards that time when Jesus will return and he will usher in eternity and final judgment. In Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 74, Zechariah shared Scripture's story, some history about God when he was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies. So when you talk about his story, you know, sharing the Bible stories of how people served God faithfully to pave the way for our Lord to come into this world, God will use you as a forerunner to pass on those basic stories of our faith. And in so doing, not only are you laying a foundation of biblical faith, you know, for those who hear you, but the Bible's message, it'll guide your own life, right? It will guide your own attitude so that you're living in a way that makes you part of his story too. By being the church to those around you. Not just going to church, but being the church. Well, a third way to use your words for preparing people for the message of Jesus is to be intentional with our culture's freedom of religion. You've got to be intentional about this. Look at what, uh, what Zechariah says in verses 74 and 75. This is kind of interesting. <clears throat> God has enabled us to serve him without fear. Do you see that? To serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. As I was thinking about that, and you know, how do our words fit into, into that verse? Uh, here's, here's something that I've come to realize. Over the years, we have been spoiled in America when it comes to enjoying the freedom of religion. You know, there are many parts in the world and throughout all of history where freedom of religion just was not something that, that people had. Christianity has served our nation and our culture well through the years, but now it is being challenged more and more. And I don't know if you pick up on this in the news or not, but it's being challenged more and more, whether it's business owners being forced to do things that violate their Christian convictions, or church camps being forced to open up their facilities to homosexual programs, or government employees being forced to attend diversity training that badmouths Christian teachings as something that's wrong, or you know, being able to put up nativity scenes and memorial crosses on public lands. All of these things are being challenged in our day. And freedom of religion, it is not something that we can take for granted anymore. If a Christian speaks out against certain immoralities, whether it be abortion or same-sex marriage or living together outside the bonds of marriage or you know, speaking out against having, allowing transgender boys to go into girls' locker rooms at the school, Christians are labeled as bigots and homophobes and haters. And I sometimes wonder if we're getting closer and closer to that day when I could be arrested for preaching about such things from a biblical perspective because I'm accused of hate speech. You know, last year in the city of East Lansing, you probably remember this story. It was out in the news. East Lansing tried to ban Steve Tennis and his country mills farm produce from the East Lansing farmer's market because they didn't permit same-sex marriages on their farm. 
their, their Christian belief that marriage is a sacramental union between one man and one woman, which is exactly what the Bible teaches us, was viewed as a discrimination violation by the city of East Lansing. It didn't matter that the farm was located 22 miles outside of the city limits. It didn't matter that they sold their produce to anyone who wanted to buy it. It didn't matter that both Steve and his wife had served in the military to protect American freedom. And now they had to fight East Lansing to protect their freedom of beliefs. Well, the city, it tried to prohibit them from selling at the farmer's market, but then the city relented when they realized that they would probably lose in a lawsuit. Or consider Chick-fil-A. You've probably heard of Chick-fil-A being in the news. Uh, they were denied recently a permit to locate a restaurant in the California airport terminal. I think it was San Francisco. Because the liberal government didn't like their Christian conservative stance on moral issues. And because they gave charitably to Christian organizations such as the Salvation Army and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. For the same reasons, Chick-fil-A ruffled the feathers of a number of professors at the University of Kansas recently when it was granted a contract to open a restaurant on their campus. And these professors, this group of professors, they said that a restaurant on, like that on their campus was unacceptable, accusing them of discrimination and intolerance, all because the restaurant owner espoused Christian beliefs and values and donated to Christian charitable causes. Who's being intolerant? <laughs> and I guess here's what my point is. If we, if we want to be able to continue to share the message of Christ freely with people without fear, then we must be intentional about speaking up for the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech. And, and I'm not talking about being rude. I'm not talking about doing it in hateful ways. But I'm saying in reasonable, well-thought-out ways. Have courage to speak up in appropriate ways. Zechariah, he praised God for being able to serve and speak without fear, something we should never take for granted or be silent about. You can be a forerunner with your use of words in another way as well, and that is encourage others. Encourage others with your words. Look at Luke 176. The father says of his son, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. It is said that when Queen Victoria was a child, she didn't know that she was in line to sit on the throne of England. And her instructors, in trying to prepare her, became really super frustrated because they couldn't motivate her and she was acting out and she just didn't seem to take her studies seriously. Well, finally, her teachers decided, let's just tell her that one day she's going to be the Queen of England. And they encouraged her in that. And upon hearing this, Victoria then quietly said, then I'll be good. <laughs> I'll be good. The realization and the encouragement that she had inherited this high calling. It gave her a sense of responsibility that profoundly affected her conduct from that point on. And Zechariah, he also helped share the destiny of John, didn't he? He helped share, shape the destiny of John when he spoke words of encouragement into his life by calling him and recognizing him as a prophet of the Most High God. A fifth way your words can help prepare the people in your circle of influence to become believers is to share God's message of salvation. Look at verse 77. John will give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. You know, on the day that the church was born, which we read of in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter had just shared the story of Christ's life with those who were assembled there to listen. The Bible tells us there were about 3,000 people, probably more than that. 3,000 were were, was the number who was saved. But he noted that they had put the Messiah to death. They crucified him on the cross, Peter preached. 
And then in Acts 2.37, it states, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? In other words, they believed, and they confessed their sins and repented, confessed Jesus as Lord, and what they were asking Peter at that moment is, how can they receive salvation? Since they already had faith, since they had already confessed their belief, Peter says this in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, faith, repentance, confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior, being baptized in the name of Jesus, that's the message of salvation. You and I are to share it. Sixth, use your words to contribute towards peace as much as it depends on you. Do you do that with your words? If you do, God will use your words to help prepare people for Jesus. We live in a culture that continues to get more and more harsh and crude in its use of words, don't we? People use words to bully others, and people use words to cut people down and, and to instigate anger and division, and that's the world we live in. But God's people must do better if they will serve as forerunners of Jesus to the lost world. Luke 1, 78 and 79 it says that John would give the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadows of death and to guide our feet into the paths of peace. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he would write in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and 18, these words, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Finally, you can be a forerunner of Jesus by the way you use your words. If you'll be present with people and engage them with the light of Jesus. Look at what we read in Luke 1, 80, verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel until he appeared publicly to Israel. There is a time for private learning and growing, isn't there? But eventually, we must walk with the people. We must walk beside them as we journey together in our relationship with Jesus. Discover the power of being present with people. God wants you to be an encourager of others with your words. And we do that best when we're on the journey together. Time Magazine once ran a story about Dwight D. Eisenhower, who eventually became the 34th president of the United States. But before he was president, Eisenhower served as a general in the Army during World War II. On March 23, 1945, during one of the last major offenses of World War II, General Dwight Eisenhower was walking near the Rhine River and he fell into step with a young infantryman who was there on the Allied side. And this young GI, he seemed depressed. And so Eisenhower asked him, he said, how are you feeling today, son? And the man, he said, General, I'm feeling awful nervous and I don't feel too good. <laughs> and Eisenhower, he replied back, he said, well, you and I are a good pair then. Because you know what? I'm nervous too. Maybe if we just walk along together to the river, we'll be good for each other. If walk along together to the river, we'll be good for each other. I love that. Because you see, being present in other people's lives, it takes time. But it's also what makes the difference. And as we wrap up this morning, I just want to ask you, do your words encourage or discourage people? Use them for building others up. You'll open doors of conversation that center around, center on Jesus and his amazing love and his purpose for our lives. And the question for our congregation this morning is simple. Are we paving the way for Jesus in our own communities 
by the words we speak, as John the Baptizer did in his day. Because in a sense, each of us is a forerunner for Christ to those who are without hope in our little circles of influence. Jesus once said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Words have power, don't they? And words have meaning. And words matter, especially when they come from the mouth of Jesus. And if you have yet to profess him as your Lord and Savior and be united with him in Christian baptism, we want to encourage you to make that decision today. I'll be standing right down here. All you need to do is come down. We'll talk about your next steps. But I want to encourage you to use your words to build other people up this week and in the days ahead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for being a precious treasure in our lives. And we thank you for the words of life that Jesus spoke for us. And may we listen to them. May we act upon them. May it change how we live and interact. May we build positive relationships that are strengthened through our, our words and our speech so that you are honored and people are brought to Jesus. May your favor and blessing go with us as we leave here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.